The following program contains adult content and sexual themes. Viewer discretion is advised. And it contains murder. Lots and lots of murder. <laughs> Stinking bastard. People tell me, hey, you're gonna go die and go to hell. At least I'm not alone. Time for 911. Where's your emergency? Oh, this is Sandy. We're pretty one. Look, Black Clear and Rose. Send the police. Send the police. Hey guys, don't be a hero, mate. I said I'm not trying to be a hero, but the police are coming. One in the chest, one in the head. Fired by Detective Sergeant Roger Rogerson. I was uh, branching out, that's when the cannibalism started, eating of the heart and uh, the arm muscle. Oh, I would have nailed Carl Williams' hands for a coffee table with this and just pulled it out of his backside. Carl Williams is a wobbly bottom little cher cherub of face, cherub face little boy who would, who, who would, who, whose, whose life would be... I harm someone each time I kill someone, there'd be an enormous amount, uh, especially at first, an uh, enormous amount of horror, guilt, remorse afterwards, but then that impulse to do it again would come back even stronger. So you're coming in with a gag, are you? No, I'm not you coming got nothing? in with a gag. You got nothing? We're just going in straight. None you, of this you, fucking about. You got nothing. Because we're just going to go in. Hi, I'm Barney Black. And I'm Tara Saraban. And we do Bloody Murder. We are a weekly true crime podcast focusing on some of the lesser known crime stories from Australia. And indeed from around the globe. What will you be talking about this week, Barney? Oh, I got my Bush Ranger hat on. Oh, awesome! Do you have your Bush Ranger beard on? I do. I've got some Bush Ranger sideburns. Um, <laughs> he, this Bush Ranger, Ben Hall, he's the Bush Ranger's Bush Ranger. Yeah. He really is. And does the bush match the drapes? It. I don't know. <laughs> well, you didn't research very thoroughly, then, did you? Well, no. Well, okay. You didn't exhume anything to check this one out. What about you, Tara? What do you got? Ah, I've got a Frenchman. Mm, yes. He's a, he's a very narcissistic Frenchman who's also a pathological liar. Thus, his pants are always on fire. And he deceived everyone, even his own family, for over 20 years. And then when he thought all of his lies were finally coming to a head, he decided to kill them all. Yeah. The people, not the lies. The lies live on. Well, how about that then? Yeah, it's um, it's not nice. But I thought it was interesting because... I'm not, I'm not great with the lying. I'm not good at it and I don't get it. So I was kind of fascinated that this guy does. But how do I know that's not a lie? Um, because I said it. Yeah, I don't no. know. Have you ever noticed me getting off on lying? Not really. Yes. That's because you're a really good liar. And you never yes. Get it. Yes. It's amazing. Um, actually, a, uh, actually a midget man from Ecuador... And yet, here I am presenting as being quite different because I'm lying about it. Well, before we get into all that tuck fuckery, yes, um, it would be. Don't we lead? Don't we? We lead with a little bit of listener feedback. Yes, just a little bit indeed. Jill Hitty Hurt posted an article on our Facebook group yesterday, which was about one of John Wayne Gacy's victims Who? being John Wayne Gacy. Oh, that clown guy. Yeah, yeah, killer clown Pogo. That was his name. Um, so about one of his victims being identified like now-ish, uh, his name was James Byron Harkinson. And so John Wayne Gacy had at least 33 known victims. And with um, us now knowing that James was one of them, there are still six of them left who are unidentified, which I didn't realise. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. It, we buried him in his basement, right? Yeah, yeah. You put all the lime down there. Yeah. You put the lime in the coconut and then... You and then he dug it all down and he didn't call anyone in the morning. There were no doctors involved. Good. Oh. Siobhan uh, sent in something and she said, thought you, you'd enjoy guys. Cunt was an ancient term that meant faithful and loyal friend. I like that when people hear the word cunt now, they think of us. <laughs> to have a cunt meant having a friend who always had your back, never abandoned you and provided friendship and support even through hard times. Society encouraged each other to value being a cunt above any other virtue. I've always told you you were a cunt, Barney. And well, you yeah. know what? I was right. Yeah, well, you're not much of a cunt, are you? I don't know. I like to think I'm a gigantic cunt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cunt. Uh, what else? Well, um, you were going to talk about the Redhead Festival world record thing. Oh, yeah. Orange to host Guinness World Record attempt for most redheads in one place. 
Uh, that was um, brought to our attention by Tracy Ladylock, by the way. Oh, yes. The Red Letter Day is September 30, when a four-hour festival of all things Red Red Wet the Bed... <laughs> Mop w- it up with gingerbread. ...will be celebrated at Wade Park, and in an attempt to better the current record, which stands at 1672. Yeah, so I think they can get more rangers in one place than that. So if I yelled out period head, all these people would turn around they and would just go, turn around. What? You talking to me? Yeah, what? What do you want? Yeah. Yeah, well, I actually think you probably, um, we can't record on that date because you'll be in orange. You'll be in orange with like, I don't know, you'll be wearing giant, giant loose fitting pants because uh, you'll probably be getting a boner with all those uh, fanta pants around you. I do like a good redhead. Uh, you like bad ones as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Yeah, you got a taste well, for the I've had ginger ba- nuts. I've had a bad experience with brunettes, really. Yeah, years. I'm sure the brunettes had pretty shitty experiences with oh, you too. No. Five star reviews on Yelp. Yeah, yeah, Yelp lies. Um, we'd also just like to take a moment to thank um, some people who gave us some very nice reviews in the past week or so. Uh, we've got Queen Critton, karate looking guy. I'm pretty sure that's you, Julian. Uh, bored with Onui Can and I, hang on, hang Zimbalima on. 13. Oh, I wanted to say that one. Oh, say it now. Zimbalina 13. Oh, you know you're driving the ladies wild with your voice when you do hey, that. Hey, um, just uh, everyone else, just don't listen to this bit. This is just for Karen. Oh, my God. You're just encouraging her, you know. Happy birthday, Karen. Okay, let's keep moving. All right. I can Launch. hear her squealing with joy right now. Ah! Happy birthday from me too, Karen. So Jean-Claude Romand was born on February 11th, 1954 in the Jura Mountains on the French side of the France-Switzerland border. Oui, oui. That's the best side. Um, It's a pretty sweet side. I'm sure the Swiss side's pretty cool too, though. We Uh, actually, we we have some listeners in Switzerland, don't we? Do we? Uh, It's Sweden, actually. <laughs> we don't have them anymore now they know I don't know which countries are yeah. which in Europe. Anyway, Jean Claude said that he had a happy childhood and received the most love two parents can give. Every morning I had a croissant and a baguette. And, and a, a bottle of wine. A bottle of red wine. Yes, the cliches will be flowing, people. Uh, he was a quiet child who kept to himself and was a good student. He said that his first foray into lying was that he would lie to his parents in order not to worry them, especially his mother, who was said to be emotionally fragile. All of his lying eventually got so out of hand that none of his family or friends really knew the guy at all. So kind of like you with all your bullshit stories, Barney. I oh, everyone knows that they're bullshit, though. They're for entertainment value. <laughs> right? You try and pass them off as the truth. I know they're bullshit, though. Only your best cunt knows they're bullshit. Um, At the end of his first year of studying medicine, Jean-Claude missed one of the papers of his exams, and as a result, he failed. Yeah, it's after a blur. Uh-huh. Only just. And he was eligible to resit his exams in September of the same year and have everything be legit. Hmm. But he wasn't into being legit. In fact, you could say he was too unlegit to quit. I see what you did there. Yes, you saw it. Didn't care for it. I don't care if you care for it. I don't do it for you. I got these gigantic breast implants for me. (laughs) Don't you love it when people say that? Oh, yeah. Um, Instead, he chose to tell all of his friends and family that he had passed his exams and nobody noticed that his name was missing from the exam results list. Well, I guess they're not... Whenever someone tells me they've passed an exam, I don't go and, like, check in the paper or make sure that they're Mm. telling me the truth. Caca in the pail. What? I was trying to do French for shit in a bucket. Right, and it was... Caca in the pail. (laughs) God. (laughs) Poor effort. Didn't yeah. care for it. Ah, uh, you know, I don't know. Someone might have liked it, but not anyone good. <laughs> Can't. You're, well, thank you. Uh, for 12 years, uh, he'd been lying, and that's a very long time to live a lie, but his narcissism and arrogance weren't going to let him admit that he was any less than he'd pretended to be all this time, so he just upped the ante even further. Well, that's you got to double down. Well, yeah, you do. Yeah. You've really got to commit to this shit. Hmm. I don't really understand lying. Like, I get no kick whatsoever out of it. No? Nah, you know, like, th- something gives you a kick. This doesn't give me a kick. Um, when I did online dating briefly years ago, um, I actually shaved a couple of years off my age I for some I, fucking I reason. I thought you were going to say you shaved something else, but... Yes, I shaved all the hair off my back. body. And then I lied about my age. And then I felt like such a fucking dick about it. Um, And I tried to change it back, but it wouldn't let me change it. Um, And so then everyone I met from that site, I had to tell that I'd lied on it because that's just my kind of shit is... I am actually 800-year vampire. 
I am 800 year old vampire. But I'm lying about my age then too because I'm actually 2000. See? Like it just, it's just oh, weird. It's, it's thing. like a sticky web, you know, you just, oh, that came out wrong. But you know, like you, you, you pull your arm out and then you get stuck somewhere else. It, and I'm just getting stuck. Yeah, no, in it's the just sticky, sticky cunt web. Is this what we're going right. for now? Um, yeah, so basically, yeah, then I had to tell people that I'd lied, which was probably a really good first impression. And so, yeah, lying and me, we don't have a great history together. What about you? Apart from all your bullshit, you much of a liar. I mean, I don't know you to be, but... I, I do occasional bullshit, but no, I don't lie. No. I, in fact, if someone thinks they misheard me, I'll correct them. You'll be like, no, what I said was I have a tiny dick. Like if someone, like if my girlfriend hears me come in at 1am... Oh, that's right. But it was actually just to get more booze and go out again. <laughs> she goes, oh yeah, I heard you come home at 1. And, 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 oh, I guess she just fell asleep on the couch. And, and then the next day I said, actually, I came home and got more booze and then I came home at 5. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was the truth of the situation and it was a harsh Sunday morning. But yeah, okay, so neither of us are particularly good at lying. That's a shame, isn't it? Oh, well, maybe it isn't. Oh, maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Anyway, after apparently graduating from university, he needed a job, so he invented one. Researcher for the World Health Organization in Geneva, specialising in cardiology. His whole career was made up. That actually sounds like a real job. Yeah, it does sound like a real one. Oh. Uh, he, well, he's really good at this lying shit. Like, he, right. they don't sound stupid. He's not like, I'm head of unicorn psychology at Mrs. Pink's Lady Academy of Dreams. Right. Like, because that doesn't sound very true. That doesn't sound very true. Where do I apply? <laughs> I have a form right here. Um, so, oh, you yeah. certainly have form. Oh, good. His whole career was made up from beginning to end. He'd said at one point that he was a lecturer at the University of Dion. I believe his uh, specialising field was mustard. Uh, yeah, you were going for that, weren't I you? I really I was. I could see you were about to do that. Um, he also said that he was the head of a clinic in Geneva, but he, he settled at this really good imaginary job at the World Health Organisation. So every day, Dr. Ramond kissed his wife, Florence, and children, three-year-old Antoine and seven-year-old Caroline, goodbye, and drove off to work in his Mercedes. He crossed the border into Switzerland with all the genuine commuters and passed the time in Geneva hanging around the public areas of the World Health Organization headquarters, such as the library, uh, or sitting in car parks, going to cafes or walking in the woods for years, every day. Wow, that's commitment. It really is. Um, this would actually be the perfect lifestyle if you were really into listening to podcasts, though. And it'd be freaking awesome. You could listen to all the podcasts you wanted oh, to. Oh, Sacre Bleu, the bloody murder has just dropped. Wee <laughs> oui, wee. Oui. Um, and also think of all the reading you could get done. Mm. Like, it's kind of a sweet gig, this lying shit. Anyway, then he'd come home after a hard day at the office inventing a new cure for cancer or working on arteriosclerosis, which was his main field. To make his lies seem more pl more plausible, he would take anything with the World Health Organization's name on it. So his house was full of medical journals and paperwork with the logo, the World Health Organization logo. So yeah, he was really into seeming like he, everything was true. He went on frequent business trips, which actually entailed him staying in a hotel near the airport, researching the places that he was supposed to be going to and bringing back souvenirs from the airport's gift shop. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> He's really committed to this. Instead of going to work, he would drive through the countryside or sit around in parks, listening to history dweebs, pleasing terrors, murder under the midnight sun, felon and true crime island. Not really. Um, no. They weren't around then. Well, they were that in was book the 1990s. Form. Yeah, so. But you know, in an ideal world. Everything was carefully planned and executed. He told his wife he was very busy and always on the move at his office, so calling him was pointless. If she needed to contact him, he told her she should page him. So not once did Florence actually try calling the World Health Organization to speak to him. She always just paged Dr. Lies. He claimed to know many well-respected doctors whom he frequently went out to lunch or played golf with, you know, in his mind. That's what doctors do, they play golf. Yeah, but I think doctors, like real doctors play real golf and fake doctors play fake golf. I like miniature golf. Yeah, me too. But I've, like, we don't play it ever. I know. I'm good at it too. Well, I'll believe that when I see it. We kick should... your ass. Well, I'll beat you with a golf club. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a putter. Yeah, well, I'd 
I'd make putter butter out of you, buddy. Um, so anyway, he never brought his friends home, his work friends, because he said he preferred to keep his private and professional lives separate. Mm. So more like he preferred to keep his private and professional lies separate. So you did there. Uh-huh. Yeah, you weren't very impressed by it, though, yeah, were you? It was all right. Oh, it was all right. Yeah. Wow. I'm moving up in your estimation, and I still don't care. It was good for you. It was good you see for that, you. Yeah, do you see that passive aggressiveness there? I did see that. Thanks yeah. for pointing it out. That doesn't. That sort of gets rid of the passive side and makes it just plain kind of... Aggressive, aggressive. Yeah. 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 Glad you can see that. Um, so when questioned his job, um, questioned, sorry, when questioned about his job, like what's it like being such an important doctor, he would always feign modesty. So you know what? I would, I would like to see you feign some modesty now, please, Barney. Oh, what I'm wearing what I'm wearing right now, this whole thing? Oh, it's nothing. No, but, uh, you know, what about how you're such a great doctor? I mean, don't you feel proud of yourself? Well, there are a lot of other people doing a lot more work than I am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was which pretty is, good. Which is actually the truth. Uh, are, you, are, you, yeah, well, <laughs> are you going to get me to do some? Oh, yeah, go on. Oh, I, I couldn't possibly. Oh, really? Yeah, I know. There are far more qualified people that could talk on this topic. Really? Who? Um, <laughs> Name three. Charlie's the Ron. Um, that stuffed monkey on the couch. Chris Farley. And Chris Farley. There you go. Cool. I couldn't possibly. It. Yeah, that was smooth. Um, so his wife joked that one day she'd find out that he was a communist spy, like that hot couple with all the awesome wigs from the Americans. I like them. I'd yeah. watch that sex tape. Yeah, actually, I, I would probably watch that too, especially if they were wearing wigs and shit. Oh, yeah, that's fake moustaches. Yeah. Um, so he claimed he was a friend of national figures such as the then Prime Minister Laurent Fabius and the political media hero Dr Bernard Kausha. His children, who were apparently very proud of his medical achievements, went to private schools and he and his family took holidays abroad. His wife enrolled in dance classes and worked as a charity volunteer. Because I think that's what like high-class doctor's wives do. They volunteer for charity. So this is in the 50s, right? They, no, they... it's in the 90s. Oh, okay, sorry. But it's in France, so... Nah, that doesn't make it the 50s. Dr. Amond was a pillar of the Jex community, supported his Catholic parish, and often took a principled stand in local politics. He even became a supporter of animal rights. What a legend! Cool. I like him. Yeah, he's done so much for humanity and animal kind. And for hotel gift shop sales. Oh, yeah. Uh, in his family and among his friends, friends, he was considered important and successful. Indeed, he was the most successful person most of his friends knew. I bet they, uh, they got a rude shock when they found out. One of the problems with having an imaginary job is that you're paid in imaginary money. See, that's not good. I've got a lot of imaginary money and it, it does not pay for dentistry. Invisible Franks. Invisible friends. <laughs> well, that just sounds like a friend that no one else can see. In order to fund his deception and raise a family in the provincial bourgeois manner, Ramond showed considerable creative ability. He knitted stuff and sold it on eBay. I was watching Wonder Woman the other day with my girlfriend, and mm -hmm. I said, why isn't the invisible plane in this? And she said, it is. It's over there. Oh, and, you just I, I actually it? looked. <laughs> and then I went, I hate you. Um, okay, so no, he, he didn't sell shit on eBay, but he was quite imaginative and creative. Uh, the Jex region has a large population of French professionals who work across the frontier in Switzerland and that, so they don't pay any French tax on their money. Uh, Ramond persuaded his family, um, sorry, his wife's family and several of his friends to give him all of their savings so that he could invest the money at 18% in a Geneva investment bank. And they fell for it. You will give me all of your francs and mm, I will invest them. I will make them grow. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Uh, he really should have been an actor. In fact, Daniel Day-Lewis is jealous of his level of commitment to the role. His reputation as an expert finance manager was completely undeserved. Every bit of the 2.5 million francs he stole over the years from his parents, his uncle, his parents-in-law and his mistress fueled his lifestyle. A lifestyle that had to be worthy of his professional status. So he had like a large house, fancy car, a wardrobe full of expensive suits to go and sit in the park in, and a prestigious private school for Antoine and Caroline. Gold-plated baguettes. Gold-plated butt plugs, gold-plated everything. The finest wines available to humanity. He had them here and he had them now. 
Um, at the time of the murders, he had less than 500 francs in his bank account because he had been burning through that shit. All went well until the inevitable day when one of his trusting investors wanted their money back urgently and he couldn't give it back to them because he'd spent it. Couldn't he pay them in invisible francs? He could have tried, but I don't think that they believed in those. Mm. Although, I mean, the people at the Unicorn Academy that he used to attend were quite into them. So he was able to pay for like um, dressage lessons there with them. Nice. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Jean-Claude's kingdom of lies was starting to catch up with him. In 1988, his father-in-law wanted to withdraw some of the money that he'd invested with him. A few weeks later, he fell to his death in an accident whose only witness was Jean-Claude. Yeah, you can see the Arc de Triomphe from this railing here on the Eiffel <laughs> Tower. Oh, it's a railing that are loose. Oh, no, no, no. What a coincidence. Mm. Uh, although it was never proven that he was responsible for his father-in-law's death, it's pretty obvious that he was. To be able to so coldly dispose of his wife's father and his kids' grandparents, uh, well, grandfather, and think nothing of the sadness and distress cutting their time with him short bought to his so-called loved ones didn't bother Jean-Claude at all. He's okay with it? He was fine with it. I bet if he'd had like a jet ski, he would have just been riding it around, yeah. like happily in circles. I bet he used to like to send back wine if it wasn't good enough. For oh, his he'd breakfast. drink drink all of the breakfast wine down to the last couple of like you know inches, yeah. and then be like, no, this wine is terrible. It's a crime against wine manatee. Wine manatee. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like a manatee that's really good at wine drinking. You don't want to oh, wrong wow. that guy. I, so, I think she was here last week. <laughs> wine manatee. Yeah. Who was she? It was you. I wasn't drinking wine. All oh, right, the vodka manatee. Yeah, that's me. Oh, the vodka manatee at all. Apparently, manatees don't like being called sea cows. I, well, why not? They just well, does it make like... him? Does it make him feel fat? Yeah. Would you like <laughs> to be called a sea cow? Um, my sea cow brings all the boys to the yard. I'm fine with it. Yeah. Sea cow away, motherfucker. Okay, manatee. Yeah, I'm I'm wine manatee. Um, so anyway, all of this was a terrible sign of what was to come. Not only did killing his father-in-law deal with the problem of the money, but his mother-in-law decided she no longer needed such a big house and moved into a smaller flat, leaving Jean-Claude to take care of the rest of her money. <sighs> mm, sacre <No>. bleu! <laughs> So four years later, it was his mistress's turn to ask for the return of her money that she'd invested. It was a total of 900,000 francs. So yeah, she wanted her money back. I guess maybe the cock was wearing off. I don't know. Friends had also started being suspicious about his job and it was all just becoming a bit much. So rather than confess the truth, Ramon decided to flame out of the entire lie. On January 9th, 1993, he withdrew 2,000 francs and bought a handgun, a silencer and gas canisters, asking the shop assistant to gift wrap them for him because that level of batshit craziness will not be memorable at all, will no. it? No. No, can I have a bow around the gas canister, please? Yeah. It's for my mom. Hmm. Uh, that night, knowing he would rather do anything than lose face, he beat his wife to death on their double bed with a rolling pin. Wow. I a rolling know, pin. A rolling pin. Um, I think the method he used here is quite telling. Like, not only do you need to be a stone cold prick to do that, but it also displays a lot of rage. It certainly does. Yeah, and that's then, very personal. Oh yeah. Then, then he left her body until the next morning, sleeping next to it, as though there was nothing vile and monstrous going on. Yeah. Uh, he uh. probably spooned it, knowing him. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. The next morning, he woke his children, mm, had breakfast, and watched cartoons. Later drank, that night, drank their breakfast wine. Well, yeah, they they weren't very thirsty for breakfast wine, um, but they were both over three, so legally they were they, they had to drink it. They too. have to, <laughs> yeah. yeah, because if kids are actually under point five, mm. they're not allowed to leave. No the more house. chocolate croissants until yeah. you've finished your breakfast wine. <laughs> That's pretty much how that goes. <laughs> Um, so, anyway. <sighs> Shit's going to get real, isn't it? It's going to get, it's going to get pretty gross. Um, later that night, he put his kids to bed and once they had fallen asleep, he shot Caroline and Antoine in the head. Oh. Yeah. Well, at least it was quick, I guess. Yeah, true. But just like, 
Is any lie worth that? Like, I don't, I don't understand it. But anyway, after slaughtering his family, um, the few remaining people who could expose him were his parents, who were both so proud of their successful son, and his mistress, who wanted back the money that she'd invested with him as a favour. So the next morning, Ramond travelled to his parents' house where he joined them for a family breakfast. Well, that sounds nice, doesn't it? What do you think they had? Well, they clearly had baguettes and wine. And cheese. And cheese. A selection, fancy of, cheese. A selection of fine cheeses. It fromage. Was, it was a fromage platter. Immediately after the meal, he repeatedly shot them both. Ah. Yeah, yeah. He's shooting the young'uns and the old'uns and, well, just pummeling his wife to death with a rolling pin. Ugh. That was clearly like, you know, he picked a rolling pin on purpose for that one. Um, so he was the kind of guy who used to call his parents to wish them good night every night. And now here he is like shooting his mum in the face and she was actually facing him when he shot her. So she would have died realising on some level that he was a piece of shit. Yeah. Um, so just to put the cherry on top of this epic shit show, he killed the family dog. Oh, no. Yeah, animal rights activist, my ass. Um, was it a talking dog who had copies of the receipts? His name was Gerard. <laughs> Probably. Um, did the dog give him a bone to invest in Geneva and wanted it back? <laughs> I would like my bone back, please. <laughs> I mean, what the hell, you French prick? Like, uh-huh. what's the dick? Like, he had a brother. The brother could have looked after the dog. Mm. I don't get it. I mean, seriously, what did poor Gerard ever do to him? Yeah. Um, That night he picked up his mistress, telling her he was treating her to a romantic meal for two. They were both just going to suck on a long piece of spaghetti until they ended up making out. But that's not how it That happens all the time, by the way. Yes, that's the only... When I think of romance, it's the only thought that comes to mind. Absolutely. Um, So pretending the car had broken down, they both got out of the vehicle. He then acted like he had a gift for her and made her close her eyes. Oh, never close your eyes. Hmm... As she did so, he sprayed tear gas into her face and attempted to strangle her with a cord. So romantic. Mm. Um, After she fought back, though, he apologised and drove her back to her house. So he was happy to kill his own children, but he balked at topping his mistress. I'm guessing that that's some kind of lusty European logic right there. Yeah, French bastard. Yeah, I don't know. Like, oh, yes, my children, I will kill them. But oh, you, you, sweet Marie, no. Oh, my little shabby. No. <laughs> Let us make birth of a nation together. Uh, in order to do this episode, Barney and I watched <laughs> watched an episode of the cartoon Pepe Le Pew as research, um, but I'm not sure it was entirely effective. What time do your legs open? No, the first bit. you got oh, a yeah. nice legs. What time do they open? <laughs> I think I told it wrong. Oh, my God, you are so, <laughs> so always do this. <laughs> so how did the pigeon that I fucked to death die? Remember that oh, that yeah. incident? <laughs> yeah, I fucked it. <laughs> oh god. Um. So anyway, he didn't kill his mistress. So I guess that's that's like a point for humanity. Um. So he went back home where like his dead wife and children were, and he sat around and watched TV for a while. Um. What do you reckon he was watching? I'm thinking it was Married with Children. Well, that does make sense. I was thinking Magnum P.I., oh, that's a sweet show. He was oh. meant to be Indiana Jones. I know he was, but then he couldn't He couldn't do it because they said, you have to shave your moustache, and he said, no, that's not true. That um, was a lie. And, and John Reese davies shit himself during during it because they all got dysentery. In there, in there, I pulled my pants. <laughs> uh, I like how everything comes back to poo with oh, us. I just, it's that comforting really and warming. That really me for some reason. <laughs> So anyway, after laughing along with the comedy truth bombs of Al Bundy, he poured petrol around the house, set it alight and took an overdose of -of out-of-date sleeping pills to try to create the appearance of an intended suicide. Oh, yes. Yeah, so whether this attempt was genuine is clearly not true since the pills he took were long expired and he had access to far more effective barbiturates. Um, Also, the man of the fire was set and the timing of his taking the pills made his rescue inevitable um, because road cleaners came by at 4am every morning and he did all this just in time for them to notice it and, of course, they called the firefighters. Romand survived this fire but was in a coma. It was two days before he regained consciousness. When he did so, it was to be told that the police had discovered that his wife and children were already dead when the fire broke out. 
Also, someone had broken into the house of his parents some miles away and shot both of them dead. He refused to talk to the police during subsequent questioning, so it was initially believed that he was too traumatised to speak. But he doesn't have emotions particularly, so that's a lie too. At first, the police assumed that the Ramond family had been the victims of some kind of feud, a family feud, if you will. Um, then routine inquiries established that Dr. Ramon did not work at the World Health Organization, nor was he even a doctor. Well, he's a doctor of lies. He's a doctor of lies. Yeah, he's a fucking wizard of lies. When confronted with the truth, Ramond continued to spin bullshit stories for as long as he could. In court, he appeared to be far more preoccupied with his own distress than with the suffering he had caused others, because of course he was. He's a narcissistic fuck. Mm. And the prosecution produced evidence suggesting that his suicide attempt, which he used out-of-date um, Nimbital and waited for the dustmen before setting the fire, was as fake as everything else about the guy. Ramon's trial began on the 25th of June, 1996. Among the reporters, the general, re- sorry, the general view was that sexual inadequacy was the key to the whole mess as physically, and I quote, Ramon had always been faintly repulsive. A, a, a bad looking French man? No. <laughs> I'm going to call Gerard Depardieu and tell him they exist. He is very handsome. Yeah, I like that his nose is like a turnip that got out of control. I like that he cut down from 24 bottles of wine a day to 12 bottles. I like that incident where he pissed on the aeroplane in the aisle. Yeah. And when he married Whoopi Goldberg, that was good. Yeah. Then her name was Whoopi Depardieu. That's a true story. Um, so faintly repulsive is a bit of an understatement. Uh, Ramond is also reputed to suffer from narcissistic personality disorder. No, no shit, buddy. Yeah, what a butt munch. <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously that's more likely than the fact that he was faintly repulsive. Uh, if only I was still doing online dating, I could put, um, I could say, what are you looking for in a man? I'm looking for someone faintly repulsive. Yeah. I'm imagining him <laughs> as kind of warty and puffy. He's a little bit puffy. He yeah. wasn't particularly warty. He actually looked nondescript to me. Yeah, I right. mean, as far as fuggers go. Um, so, yeah, people need to stay away from narcissists because they will burn you and they will not feel bad about it. No, they won't. Nah. Um, so in early July of that year, I've forgotten what year it was. It was the late 90s, 96. Um, Ramond was sentenced to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole for 22 years. So he's been eligible for parole since 2015. They didn't guillotine him. Um, nah. They don't they, do that anymore? They didn't want to, like, waste their blade. No, I'm pretty sure they don't do that yeah, anymore. Yeah, they don't do I don't that think anymore. they've done that in a long time. No. Not since the French Revolution. They only do it to cut their baguettes now. <laughs> um, so he hasn't been let out yet, though. I think they're like, mm, you can just stay here. Uh, he's also quoted as saying that, Finally relieved of the burden of 20 years of lies, he's never felt so free. Wow, I'm happy for him. I know, what an ass hat. He's an ass beret, that's what he is. An ass beret. Yeah, ass berry beret. Uh, that's ass what this berry fucker berry. is. <laughs> well, that's what you did there. Yeah. Oh, and I liked it. Thank you. I, I just magically flew out of my flaming cunt mouth. So flattered by the interest taken in his case by various prison visitors that he refers to as guardian angels, as well as by members of a Catholic movement known as the Intercessors, Ramond has sought forgiveness and salvation in God. Mm. In oh God. In jail, he claims that for the first time in his life, he can finally be himself. This is a quote. Events of a mystical nature, not easy to communicate, have deeply stirred me and become the foundations of my new faith, he wrote in the Intercessors, Inter- <laughs> Intercessors newsletter. Wow, so, where do I get one of those? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Right? Just look up these guys. this guy's ass. You'll probably see it. So, yeah, everything's like still all about him and will continue to be Absolutely. so because it was an event of a mystical nature, I'm fucking sure. He confidently believes that God has forgiven him and that he will one day rejoin his murdered family in heaven. Now, if that's true, I hope they're up there waiting for him with tear gas, rolling pins and guns. And stale red wine. Yeah. Out of a a box. Out of a box. A big, horrible cask of red wine for the Asbury Beret. (laughs) Asbury Beret. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I think we have the title of this episode. I think we do. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That was cool. Yeah, what a shithead. Can you imagine being comfortable enough with lying that much? 
No. And then wanting to save face so bad that you're going to kill your own children. I mean, of course, not your mistress, but you'll kill your kids. Yeah. Like, the fuck? Watch out for narcissists, really. They they will damage everyone. It's not cool. And by the way, um, if you find yourself in a relationship with a narcissist, break up with them. Yeah, yeah. And also, read up on the topic. They'll be fine with it, by the way. Oh, no, no. They'll try and mind game you for a while. Seriously, they will. A lot of the time, it's not going to hurt them. They can't feel that. They have no, no, but they'll they'll feign it. They'll be no. like, um, oh no, but that's your fault. Everything's gonna be your fault. That'll be a key. Um, but yeah, goblins. Yeah, nasty shit, man. Yeah, yeah, we we call them goblins, yeah. uh, Barney and I, and um, we call them that for a reason because goblin mm. is as goblin does, and they are bad people. There's some goblinism in my story too. Goblinism. Goblinism. I, I like that. Let me let me hear. I mean, I hate goblins, but goblin stories can be interesting. Well, Ben Hall has been overshadowed by Ned Kelly in history. Well, Ned Kelly was bigger than Ben Hall. Well, it's but it's curious to us as to why. If you compare the two as bushrangers, Ned Kelly's career is very, very small in comparison to Ben Hall's. Hmm. Ned Kelly was about 10 years old when Ben Hall was writing, and there's strong evidence to say that Ned Kelly idolised Ben Hall somewhat. Oh, did he have posters of him up all over his bedroom walls? Yeah, and he used to kiss them. Yeah, did he um, Did he wear the mouth of one of his Ned Kelly... No, his Ben Hall posters see, out. See, the thing is, <laughs> listeners, Tara used to idolise River Phoenix and she had a poster on her wall and she wore out the lips on it from kissing it every night. I used to kiss it goodnight. I didn't use any tongues. And then it started, like, the mouth bit started to go, so like, So you filled it in with brown pencil, didn't I you? I filled it in with brown pencil, but it wasn't very effective. So and then my brother picked lips. up on it. And then I had shit lips. And then then River Phoenix found out. And, well, we all know what happened then. River Phoenix. <laughs> so I am actually partially oh, responsible. Never be an for... old man, River, thanks to you. Yes, thanks to me making out with his poster. It was something he just couldn't live with. And, um, well, I'm surprised I'm able to live with it, to tell you the truth. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad that everyone knows that story now. Yeah. Thank you, Barney. You've gone a little red, actually. <laughs> it's pretty fucking embarrassing. Uh, from the 1850s to the 1880s, bush ranging was at its height in Australia, akin to America's Wild West. Easy money and gold was there for the taking on the end of a gun. Ooh. Desperados such as uh, the likes of Jesse James and Billy the Kid unknowingly followed in the footsteps of Australia's Ben Hall, Frank Gardner, Mad Dog Morgan and Captain Thunderbolt. Oh, I like the last two. They had cool names. Yeah, and later, Jesse James contemporary Ned Kelly. Ben Hall had his own Robert Ford. Did you know that? Betrayed, no, I, I don't know shit about Ben Hall. Betrayed dude. for blood money by the devious Mick Conley. Oh, Mick. wonder yeah. if he's a patty. Hey, Mick, get stuffed. Yeah, yo, Mick, go fuck yourself, mate. Uh, ben Hall was born May 9th, 1837 at Maitland, New South Wales. His parents were Benjamin Hall. Oh, well, what? Okay. Yeah. Born in Bedmin- Ben Minton. <laughs> in Bedminster, England. <laughs> That's not a word. He's born in Bedminster, England. Is it? I know what I mean. And Eliza Summers was born in Dublin. Uh, his parents, uh, both of Ben's parents, were convicted for minor stealing offences and transported to New South Wales. Well, that's how most of us got here. So they first met each other as convicts. Well, that's romantic, isn't it? Isn't it? Benjamin received his ticket of leave in August 1832, but it wasn't until 1834 that Eliza was granted her freedom. Hey, so she was like more b- 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 bad to the bone than he was. Yeah. Cool. They were, they were married the same year. The couple had numerous children. Ben Jr. was the fourth child and third son. Well, what did they call their other sons? They were they, all called they Ben. They were all called Ben. And they had a dog. And guess what the dog's name was? I believe it was called Ben. No, it was John. Oh, okay. Young Ben spent his early years w- working with horses and cattle, developing his expertise in stock work and bushcraft. Oh, world of bushcraft. Yeah, skills which would stand him uh, in good stead in later years. Well, that would stand all of us in good stead. Uh, this is from a newspaper at the time. He mm-hmm. said, He attended school for about two years and a half and learned to read and write and obtained sufficient knowledge of arithmetic to enable him to conduct his own business. Well, so he would have been seven and a half and he's able to run a business? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's, that's pretty a different, sweet work. That's a different time. Yeah, seven and a half. It's a bit late to be starting your own business by that age. Oh, I know. You, you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> May as well be pretty ready for retirement by <laughs> seven and a half. <laughs> Absolutely. In 1856, at the age of 19, Ben married um, Bridget Walsh. She was officially known as Biddy. Biddy? Yeah. I bet she wasn't tall. So they were married in Bathurst. Kitty, one of Biddy's uh, sisters, was married to a stockman named John Brown, but in 1862... They have hamster names. 
She became the mistress of Frank Gardner and eloped to Queensland. Ooh, goblin. So just remember there's goblin in the family. Oh, yeah, in the Walsh goblin. Family. Goblin runs in the family. Uh, in August 1859, Ben and Biddy had a son, whom they named... Ben. Henry. Okay, good. In 1859, Ben Hall and John Maguire jointly leased the Sandy Creek, run of 10,000 acres south of Forbes. Delightful. I know. In 1861, he let police stay overnight in his house. Now, by the way, the police, they didn't call them police in those days. They Did they ca- call them de popo? No. Did they call them the pigs? No, they didn't call them the jacks too. They called them the traps. Why'd they call them the traps? I don't know. I'd looked that up, but I couldn't find it. Okay. Maybe it was in, in honour of Admiral Akbar because they were a trap. Hmm. Admiral Snack Bar. It's a wrap. <laughs> Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> I'm fired out of the cannon <laughs> into the sun, aren't I? You're so fired. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so he let the police stay overnight, the traps, stay in his house, while they were hunting the bush ranger, Frank Gardner. Was he, he friends with Frank Gardner? Well, he knew him, yes. But they, weren't fr- they were like business associates. No, they, he just knew him. <laughs> right, it's just like Frank, look, we're not friends exactly, but yeah, I know him. Yeah, he's an acquaintance. Okay, no, like like us. Like us. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, I would he, let the trap stay at my he house. Wasn't, he wasn't like one of his best cunts. No, more like us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Makes sense. Uh, one of the men, James Taylor, I've ah. seen fire and I've seen rain. He's seen sunny days that he thought would never end. Yeah, well, James Taylor used the opportunity to... To write a song about it. Yeah, to, and used the opportunity to sweet talk his wife and finally persuaded her that her life was with him and not with Ben. James Taylor stole his wife. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then he wrote that steamroller song about it. Completely cut his lunch. Yeah. Cut it and ate it. Cut it and ate it. Ben was said to have taken up bush ranging then at the age of 22 after two wrongful arrests and, as he said, to meet the man who ruined my happiness. Wow. Okay. So So he's got it in for James Taylor. Well, I mean, a lot of people probably do. Yeah. Like, I don't know, like hard rock musicians. They probably don't like him. Yeah. I don't want that tutti frutti classic rock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so he's decided to become a bush ranger because his goblin wife ran off with a folk singer. And he was hassling him, and of course the the traps are going to look after each other. Right. So the police start harassing him back. That's fucked. So after another wrongful arrest on suspicion of being an accomplice, a bush ranger... He wrongfully arrested a lot for a white guy. Yeah, a bush ranger, Frank Gardner, pops up again. He spent four or five weeks in the clink until he was released due to lack of evidence. Colonel Clink? No, he was. He, he didn't was sp- inside. They shrunk him down and put him inside Colonel Clink's body. <laughs> they, this has got nothing to do with Hogan's heroes. Okay. Well, then the whole you can have to start again. There is I'm a, seeing this whole thing wrong. There is a guy called Schultz coming up oh. though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where the I truth is nothing. anymore. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so he was released due to lack of evidence. So he's he's starting to get a bit sick of being, you know, well, called a criminal when he's all not. The freaking time, yeah. If anyone's a criminal, it's James Taylor for so, banging his wife. Remember Frank Gardner? I do. Okay, so he was a bush this ranger. is when he began his disastrous association with Frank. Mm, you shouldn't hang out with Frank. Uh, Gardner led a gang of eight men, including Ben Hall, in robbing the gold escort coach near uh, Ugara Sounds in New like South a strip Wales. Joint. They robbed it of banknotes and 2,700 ounces of gold worth more than 14,000 pounds. And they took three blondes with them. Ben Hall and several others were arrested in July, but once again, the police were unable to gain enough evidence to formally charge him. Okay. He was released about the end of August. However, he and his partner at Sandy Creek, facing mounting legal costs, lost their lease of, of their property. Ah, oh, bummer, dude. Yeah. Estranged from his wife and young son and with his property gone and after several confrontations with the police, um, accumulated in the trap's decision to burn down Hall's hut at Sandy Creek. Oh, bastards! So the police decide to burn his house down. That's not cool. Uh, ben Hall gradually drifted into a life of crime and became the leader of one of the most notorious bushranging gangs in the 1860s and arguably the most competent of all bushranger leaders. Did they have a cool name? Yeah, they did. What was it? The Ben Hall Gang. Ah, couldn't they have been called Hall and Oates? We'll get to that. Okay. I'm not a criminal. I've been driven to this life. The traps arrested me on Forbes Racecourse last year and I was held for a month in jail, an innocent man. While I was away, my wife ran away with a policeman. Well, with a cove who used to be in the police force. Then I was arrested for the, for the mail coach robbery and held another month before I was let out on bail. When I came home, I found my house burned down and cattle perished of thirst. This does actually sound like the beginning of one of those revenge action that's, movies. That's a quote from Ben Hall. 
In one instance, Hall and his gang bailed up Robinson's Hotel in Carrawindo, New South Wales. So he's well into the bush ranging now. Yeah. All travellers and the town's pe- people were required to remain at the hotel, but they were not mistreated and were provided with food and entertainment. That sounds awesome. You have to stay at the pub. There's food. Yeah. We'll sing you some James Taylor songs. No, no, James Taylor. He doesn't like James no, Taylor. No, he doesn't like James Taylor. He, he hates does. fire and he hates rain. Yeah. The local policemen were subject to humiliation by being locked up in their own jail. Did they pants him? Did they dack him? They dacked him. When the hostages were set free, the gang insisted on paying the hotelier and giving the townspeople expenses. Hey! So essentially they were forced to be at a party, but they got paid for it, so it was okay. So their aim was to, em- their aim was to emphasize that the gang could act with impunity and to uh, belittle the traps. Yeah, the popo. fuck you, coppers. Yeah, fuck hey. you, popo. Shortly afterwards, the gang raided the town of Bathurst, followed a few days later by another takeover of Kenowindra. This time the party lasted for three days. Hey, Bush Ranger's coming up, so you better get the party started. (laughs) I don't know, was that cute, bad, or just appalling? Uh, (laughs) So, yeah, anyway, the party went on for three days. Hey. uh, Until some dray drivers warned uh, Hall and his gang that the river was rising and they needed to leave before they were stranded. So they've there's he's had the, the fire. rain. He's, he's had, had the, the fire. fire. Now there's the now rain. He's, now oh, he's no. having the rain. Okay, well, the next bit is sunny days that he thinks will never end. So that'll be nice. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. There were plenty of sympathisers who offered their them safe hiding places and who in turn were often rewarded with a share of the goods. Ben Hall was also seen as a Robin Hood figure, stealing from the rich and redistributing the booty to his uh, supporters, family and friends. Ah. Oh. And his booty wasn't too bootylicious for them? Mm, apparently not. Okay, well, that's good. Their cavalier activities were soon brought to a sudden halt, however, when Mickey Burke was killed at Dunn's Plain. Uh-oh. John Vane re- surrendered to police and O'Mealy was shot in an attack on Goimbla Station. That's a weird word. <laughs> it's easy for you to say. Uh, the gang of five had been reduced to just two. Oh, so they're just a duo Hall and, now. Hall and Gilbert. <laughs> oh, where's Oates? Uh, well, in 1864, the gang added 15-year-old John Oates to their ranks. And there comes... They did not. And that's when it started, Hall and Oates. Right, right, so this is actually just a, like an um, origin story about Hall and Oates? Yeah, um, yeah. Did you make the bit about the Oates guy up? I did. Yeah. I, li- <laughs> I lied to you. His actual name was John Dunn. And he was only 14 when he joined the gang. Ah, uh, see, that's, that's a little bit young, isn't it? I know. He's like an apprentice But he was already ranger. wanted by the law for robberies and stuff. Okay, well, you know, as long as he started oh. early, as long as he was, you know, younger than seven and a half, because that's when you go bad. In November of that year, during the robbery of a mail coach at Black Springs Creek, uh, John Gilbert shot and killed Sergeant Parry. And his Lonely Hearts Club band? Yeah. Then in January 1865, Constable Nelson was shot and killed by John Dunn when the gang raided a hotel. Oh, they're getting a bit killy. In early 1865, the activities of Ben Hall's gang and the inefficiencies of the police were discussed almost daily in the New South Wales Parliament. As a result, the government rushed through the Felon Felon Apprehension Act. Oh, well, oh, that's a good show. I don't feel apprehensive about it at all. The Felon Appreciation Act. Yeah, that's more like the it. The Felon's Apprehension Act, 1865. The act enabled the gang to be outlawed and made it possible for anyone to shoot them rather than arrest them and go to trial. Seriously, like anyone who wanted so, to shoot them? Yeah, dead or alive, kind of. Wow. Yeah. Anyone can shoot them. That's harsh. Uh, it was 20 years later, the colony of Victoria passed its own Felon Appre- Apprehension Act aimed at stopping Ned Kelly and his gang. You're having trouble not saying Phil and Appreciation Act, aren't you? I know. That's because we really like that podcast. That is a good show. <laughs> but there's no more shows at the moment because he's got a baby. Yeah, he's on a baby break. That's yeah, okay. That's He'll be enough. back. In February 1865, uh, Ben Hall's gang uh, brought out the song Man Eater, which reached <laughs> the top 40 in the US. And it was about his goblin ex. And uh, then they attacked the four faithful brothers of Springfield Station as they travelled into Goulburn. To the surprise of the Bush Rangers, the teenage boys fought back. Oh, yeah, yeah. teenagers. They could go either way. So uh, I was in Canberra during mm-hmm. the Christmas holidays, and I saw this. Um, the National Museum in Canberra has the 1851 Colt revolver believed to have been dropped by Ben Hall. Oh, he dropped it? He dropped it. Well, that was a bit, like, unco, I guess. Because he had to run away from the teenagers. Ooh, oh. I don't like the look of those teenagers. Uh, when he dropped his gun. When he dropped I, his gun. I'm not sure how uh, how good a bush ranger he really is. Also at the museum, a medal was awarded to the Faithful Brothers by the New South Wales government in recognition of their courageous resistance. Right, okay. Mm. By now, the reward on Ben, 
Ben Hall's head had reached 1,000 pounds and he was running out of friends to trust. That's a lot of James Taylor CDs. Yeah. LPs, whatever. Out of touch, out of touch. (laughs) Yeah. And he's out of his head when you're not around. I know. So Ben Hall's gang um, were well organised with good equipment and they were well behaved, apparently. Except for shooting a couple of uh, traps. Yeah, but, you know, they had nice manners. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, sir. That's right. Mm. They robbed wealthy wealthy travellers and were able to rely on the support of poorer people to hide them. As a result, Hall's gang was able to avoid capture by the police. And stay in the top 40 for weeks at a time. Weeks at a time. From 1863 to 1865, Ben Hall and his uh, gang conducted one of the most prolific periods of bushranging in the colony. Hundreds of robberies were attributed to them in this time, including the hold, holding up of several villages, dozens of mail coach robberies, because I just go through the letters because people had cash in them. Right, like, okay. They wouldn't read any of the ones that had and, glitter and perfume. And the regular theft of uh, prized racehorses. Why did they need racehorses? Were they well, betting on them? Hall's men were well-led, well-armed, and their stolen racehorses easily out, outrun the poorer police uh, oh, horses. Oh, that's clever. You know what they started doing, though? Because they'd, they'd rob all these coaches, mm-hmm. and um, they'd, they'd have all the schedule of the coaches, and they had Ben Hall permitting arrival time. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. Ben Hall permitting. Legendary. But and no, now, was he like, he wasn't violent and rapey, was he? Oh, no, nothing No, like he that. was kind of like one of those gentleman highwaymen, like Adam yeah, Ant. Like Adam Ant. And what they used to do too is when they were transporting big uh, chunks of cash, they'd cut the cash in half, so it was just, and bundle it up. And then it, they, then they'd... Um, what, literally each note? or they Each would... note. And then they'd transport the other halves on a different day. And then they'd sticky no tape it back together. And then they'd sticky tape it back together. Seriously? This is, yeah. Wow, that's what that was the best they could do. And see, they were hoping that Ben Hall would just leave it because it's worthless. Because the only half, he was like, he went and found the other half. No, he didn't find the other half, but he took the halves anyway and burned them just because just it was ruining it for everybody. <laughs> oh right, he's just like, um, fuck the patriarchy. That's right. In April 1865, Hall and the others realised that to survive, they would have to leave New South Wales. They intended on getting passage to the United States. Wow, I guess it was a different world. They felt that the Civil War now raging there would be a good cover for them to slip in quietly. Interesting. In fact, Ben Hall had committed over 600 robberies, but he never killed anyone, and this contributed to his image as a popular knockabout knucklebutt from the bush. <laughs> he sounds pretty cool. Was he yeah. hot? That other bush ranger, Captain Moonlight, the way you talked about him, like everyone was like, ooh, he sounds hot. He had some, he had some awesome sideburns, but he kind of had a chin strap too. You know that oh, so he didn't have, have like around. a full beard. No. Oh, okay. No. So before the intended long trip north, they uh, first retreated to an isolated area on Goobang Creek. To work well, on their tans. To work on their tans. And get their wardrobes together. And to write a few more hit singles. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's just northwest of Forbes, intending to gather fresh horses and provisions. Ah, fresh horses. But Ben Hall's hiding place was betrayed to police by an accomplice who was safeguarding Hall's escape money. The devious Mick Conley. Ah, uh, Mick? Yeah, apparently it was because his wife fancied him. Right. But his he wife never did anything with her. Well, no, he doesn't no. sound like the type, does he? So, okay, so this guy was jealous and he had their money. So there's a bit of a, you know, Now, his, his other friends, John Gilbert and... Um, Sullivan, was it? And Dunn. <laughs> right, yeah. That's his name. Yeah, they'd, they'd gone somewhere else. Yeah. Okay, they'd split up. Mm-hmm. They broke up the band. They broke up Yoko. the band. Just was for there a, a Yoko? Just for a little while. No, they were going to meet up later. Oh, okay. They were going to do a US tour. But that's when, when troopers arrived at Ben Hall's camp before dawn. Uh, it was just Ben Hall there. Oh, he was um, alone. Yeah. And they waited until sunrise until they could identify him. When when the plane closed, uh, but armed men emerged from the bush, Hall ran in the opposite direction before being shot in the shoulder and back. Ben Hall did not fire a shot. Ben Hall called out to his friend Billy Dargan, an Aboriginal tracker who was close by. Uh, he was trying to take him alive. He said, I'm dying, I'm dying, shoot me dead. Hall, having previously vowed, they'll never hang Ben Hall, don't let the traps take me alive. Yeah, I'd rather be shot than hanged. So he's been shot twice and he's fallen to the ground, right? Yeah. The other troopers opened fire after he hit, hit the ground and police report uh, stated that 30 bullets were found in his body. Well, well, that's a little bit excessive, isn't it? I know. He must have weighed a ton. 
The Bushranger ballad, The Streets of Forbes, records the life and death of Ben Hall, believed to have been devised by his brother-in-law after he saw Ben's body paraded through Forbes. Oh, they paraded it. They were like, woo, look what we did. Yeah. We killed the dude that you like. And I, 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 I'm just going to re- recite a stanza from I that ballad. I wish you'd sing it, but okay, reciting's fine. Dargan, he was chosen to shoot the outlaw dead. The troopers then fired madly, filled him with lead. They rolled him in a blanket and strapped him to his prad and led him through the streets of Forbes to show the prize they had. Wow, I just find that very odd, but okay. Hmm. I guess they wanted to have a parade. There was lots of songs written about him. <laughs> this whole thing's been a, quite a delve into musical history. The Illustrated Sydney News reported, not yet 25... Is that, is that just a cartoon of the news, the well, Illustrated Sydney News? Well, they just have illustrations there. They just have pictures, but no words. <laughs> Shut up, Tara. <laughs> no. The Illustrated Sydney News reported, not yet 25 years of age, the oh, iron shit, entered the young. soul of Ben Hall. He fought he fought forgetfulness in reckless inci- excitement. On examining the body, it was seen that he had received about 30 bullets, two of which had passed through his brain. On his person, they found three loaded revolvers, 70 pounds in cash, three gold chains, and the miniature of a female. What well, he had like a, a little woman with A little him. action figure of Wonder Woman. Oh, uh, right. Well, that's hot. No, it's like a little portrait in, a, in like a locket. Who was it a portrait Apparently of? His goblin? It was, no, it was of his sister. Oh, okay. Hmm. Her name. Her name was Ben. Her name was Benita. <laughs> uh, when his brother's wife was turning from a last look, it is uh, said she remarked, had it not been for Ben Hall's wife, he would have not been laying there. Right. The goblin made him do it. Yeah. Goblins, they'll lead you astray. So you want to find out what happened to John Gilbert and John Dunn? Yeah, I want to know more about their hit songs. Well, they tried to release some albums afterwards. Gilbert and Dunn doesn't have a great lost, ring to it. It lost the magic of Hall and Oates. Yeah, it would have. <laughs> Gilbert was shot dead by police in May 1865 and his body exhibited at Bin Long Police Station for three days. Wow, they just, like, put the corpse out with it. Did they charge admission? I don't understand all of this, like, medieval kind of come look at the corpse we have shit. Dunn was captured on Christmas Eve 1865 and taken to stand trial for his earlier shooting of Constable Nelson. John Dunn was hung in March 1866, stating in a letter to his father that he was in very tolerant spirits. I'm feeling particularly tolerant today, Father. And how are you feeling about being hung, son? I'm incredibly tolerant of the entire situation. Well, I'm all right with it. Oh, cool with it, mate. He was, all right. he was all right with it. Well, my music career's over. I mean, what else am I going to do? Ben Hall's body was taken back to Forbes, where an inquest was held by the police magistrate. The official verdict of the coronial, coronial inquest... Under William Ferran, the police magistrate, was justifiable homicide. Well, yeah, I mean, he was running away. Um, I guess that's justifiable. And they shot him in the back. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's very justified. And then shot him another 29 times after that. Well, they had to make sure that it took. (laughs) Yeah. He was buried in the Forbes Cemetery on uh, Sunday, May 7th, 1865. Isn't that your birthday? Oh, Valentine's Day, June 27th. <laughs> 1865. Uh, a headstone was erected in the 1920s because, you know, Bush Ranger was the rage then after they yeah, banned all the yeah, films. Yeah, yeah, so. because, like, they weren't always thought of as super cool, but at that point they were. On um, Cinco de Mayo, 1957. 5th of May. 5th of May. The Forbes Historical Society had a big Cinco de Mayo party. Hey! No, and dedicated a plaque at Gooban Creek where Hall had been shot. Did they make a piñata out of him? There's a statue of Ben Hall with all his bushy sideburn awesomeness outside the Forbes Visitor Information Centre. Is it made of bronze? It is made of bronze. It would be hard to get bushy sideburns right with bronze. It looks pretty good. I had a look. Did you give it a little kiss? Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I didn't I didn't see it in person. I looked oh. at a picture. But oh, okay. I, but I did kiss my computer screen. Did you screen. kiss the picture of it until its mouth wore off and you had to draw it on with brown pencil? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if I'd had a good reputation before this podcast, it would be ruined. <laughs> so back to the statue. It was apparently it was commissioned by Ben Hall the Third, great grandson of Ben oh, Hall. Oh, that's can, like with the whole tradition of calling everyone Ben. Yeah. What was his dog called? John. Ah, oh, well, that's a tradition in itself. Yeah. <laughs> there was a cave in an isolated section of the Wedden Range near Grenfell, that was a hidey hole for Ben Hall and his gang, and is known as Hall and Oates. Ben Hall's Cave. (laughs) I just wasn't ready for that. I had nothing. A number of folk songs recount Hall's life and exploits. The most notable is Streets of Forbes. Look that up on iTunes. There's lots of bands that have done it, Um, which I quoted earlier, a stanza from. Others include The Ballad of Ben Hall's Gang, The Death of Ben Ben Hall, and The Ghost of Ben Hall. 
Oh, I'd like to hear about what his ghost got up to. Yeah. Probably more bush ranging. Now, sidebar, Tara. Yes, Barney. The story of the Kelly Gang is a 1906 Australian silent film about Ned Kelly, well, obviously. Well, clearly. I guess it could have been about, I don't know, um, one of our, one of um, the people that sponsor us, Kelly Brighton. <laughs> it was shot in Melbourne, and the film ran for more than an hour with a real length of about 4,000 feet, and it was the world's first feature-length film. Oh, sweet. Um, it was first shown in Melbourne and then um, in the United Kingdom, and it was uh, a commercial and critical success. And it is regarded as the origin point of the bush ranging drama, uh, a genre that dominated the early years of Australian film production. So in 1911, there were four films made about uh, Ben Hall. <laughs> Did they all have his name in the title as well? Yeah, Ben Hall, a notorious bush ranger, Ben Hall and his gang. Ben Hall's Breakfast. Yeah, A Ride for Life, Ben Hall is Awesome. Yeah, um, I Heart Ben Hall, his sideburns yeah. were hot. All of that. Wow, in, that that last one was a particularly good movie. Quite compelling. Funnier than you would imagine. Yeah, very funny. Mm. In 1912, Bush Ranger films were banned by an act of parliament. <laughs> They're just like, we're so sick of this Ben Hall shit. We know. We, we know. know. In 1975, there was an Australian television series called Ben Hall. And uh, last year, a new Australian film, The Legend of Ben Hall. And Deck, which I, which Deck I, Ben Hall with Bows of Holly? I, I, that was I, a Christmas movie. I watched that this morning and it was good. Yeah, did you learn a lot? Well, uh, the guy who uh, plays uh, Ben Hall, he's a bit of a dream boat. He's yeah? got these big blue eyes. I could oh, just swim in. Oh, yeah. Were you like almost drowning in them going, oh. rescue me, Ben Hall, rescue me. Hey, um, I was thinking I might do some more Bush Ranger stories over the next few weeks. I think they're pretty cool. Um, While I don't, we ask our listeners to let us know, yay or nay. Um, Captain Thunderbolt sounds cool. I don't know much about him. He's got an awesome nickname. I'm actually a bit disappointed in Ben Hall that he didn't branch out and get himself an awesome nickname. And Mad Dog Morgan. Well, he sounds cray-cray and I like it. There was a 1976 film uh, of Mad Dog Morgan with Dennis Hopper in it. Oh, my God. Can you imagine trying, hey, trying to direct Dennis Hopper in 1976? You would have been having a battle. I know. You would have been tripping balls I most know. of the time. Tripping balls and drinking whiskey. The story of Ben Hall. So how about Ben Hall, eh? Yeah, I think I like him. Are there any pictures of him available? Yeah. Yeah, cool. I want to check those out. And yeah. of course, I'll be putting them on our Facebook uh, group. Well, the, when he, he when he um he went to say goodbye to his son, and uh, he ben gave Junior. Ben Junior. Ben Junior. No, no, he was called Henry. Henry, that's right. Yeah. And, he, and he gave him a photo of him and said, "Remember me," because he was going to go to America, but he never made it. And uh, well, you know, that's in the state library now. But you oh, can look that okay. up on the web. Yeah. Cool. I look forward to it. Hey, um, we break, and we're back. I hope everyone enjoyed that wee break as much as we did. It was great. Uh, palette cleanser time. Yep, as he has. Um, these are short stories of criminal stupidity with a quintessentially Australian flavour. Um, this one's a doozy. I had already thought of doing this, um, but then Holly Marie Dunning also alerted me to the fact, as did Yentl. Nice one, Yentl. Um, so a man who lives in Heatley, Queensland, has told of how he chased off two men with a trident which is like a three-pronged spear and a chainsaw during a home invasion. Where do you get a trident from? Um, the trident shop. I mean, like tridents are. I us. mean, Aquaman has one, and Poseidon. Well, I guess you mug Aquaman. But... So, Boys Court resident Johnny Smith said the two men came into his home last week while he and a friend were playing video games in the living room. Johnny said there was a knock on the door at about 9.30pm last Tuesday night and he opened it expecting another friend of theirs who was coming over but instead faced a young man that he didn't know. He walked in, asked for some guy and I said that he didn't live here, Johnny said. All of a sudden, we heard the back door opening and another man walked through in through it. That's what he said, walked through in through it. Um, I had a tire iron against the wall and the first guy reached down, grabbed it and started yelling and then the guy who came through the back door slammed me up against the wall demanding money. Johnny said he initially tried to tell them that his wallet was in his car but they wouldn't let him go and get it. It was a good try though, Johnny. So I said, oh, it's in my spare bedroom and they let me go into the spare room where I grabbed the trident just behind the door. Johnny said he then lunged at the closest man with the weapon, which is a replica of the trident used by fictional superhero Aquaman, as uh, you said. Yeah. Yep. He screamed like a girl, he said. If he hadn't moved, he wouldn't have been walking real well. <gasps> oh, Jesus. That was my screaming like a girl. I don't know, man. That just sounded like a did, like an angry monkey. Did you get frightened? 
I just wasn't expecting it. It made me feel weird, <laughs> which is my natural state. So, no, not particularly scary. Uh, Johnny said that he then grabbed a chainsaw from where it was sitting on his washing machine and started it, chasing the two men out the door. That's pretty cool. That's great. Um, they've then tried to steal a car from outside, so I've run out with a chainsaw, he said. That's the quickest I've ever seen people squeeze through a gap in a fence and run off. Johnny said he found it easy enough to keep his cool during the incident. I'm from Darwin. I've worked in building and stuff. We got bought up hard and rough, he said. I guess I knew as soon as I got the trident, I knew the tables had turned. Maybe they might think twice about going into someone else's house next time. Johnny said the men managed to steal two mobile phones and a gold bracelet. Detective Sergeant Fred Starr from the Kerwan Criminal Investigation Branch said investigations were ongoing, but police had not located the men. There are people on the street who hadn't actually observed the incident, but have been able to assist, he said. Sergeant Starr said the chainsaw had been heard by neighbours, but had been used more as a frightening tool than a weapon. I think he took the opportunity to grab the chainsaw he'd used trimming some trees as a scare tactic, he said. It certainly seemed to work. Don't fuck with Aussie Aquaman fanboys. They no. will cut you with their tridents. <laughs> yeah, will spear you, yeah. I know, but I love that's, that he had a, a he had a trident handy. Cracker, a doddler. It was freaking cool. It was that's, Aussie as, yeah, mate. Yeah, Aussie as. Hey, we're... Uh, we're nearly out of here, aren't we're we? We're nearly out of here. We should thank our delightful patrons. Sean, this might hurt a little. Wheelan. Kelly, eight legs, two fangs and an attitude, Brighton. David, man is the warmest place to hide, Laity. <laughs> Jim, his story will touch you, even though he can't, DeGriz. Nothing spreads like fear, man is <laughs> are. <laughs> Way to fuck it. <laughs> nothing spreads like fear, man is are. Oh, that was nothing, beautiful. Nothing spreads like grandma, butter. Man is are. Uh, Kinnan, there can be only one ten. Ab, one dream, four Jamaicans, 20 below zero, <laughs> hate. <laughs> Frankie, there will be blood, Jaya Sakara. And Holly, a thrill crazy, kill crazy, Andrew. <laughs> and Laura, her life was in their hands, now her toe is in the mail, sneak shad. Um, if you would like to support us, visit our Podbean page and click on the patron button. Um, there are some sweet, sweet benefits to be had. In fact, we just dropped a new Patreon episode. Yes, we did. And um, it's pretty good, if I do say so myself. There are goblins in it. There's all uh, links in in the show notes to all of these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, merch. Hey, if you're buying merch, because people are, because it's good, Woo-hoo! send us some photos. Oh, yeah, we want to see you um, in the T-shirts and with the stuff, because yeah. that would be pretty awesome. That would be awesome. So um, I've been Tara Sarabin. Oh, you're doing the name change again? And I guess I've been Barney Black. And we just did some bloody murder. Please don't forget to uh, review us on iTunes. And of course, rate and subscribe. It really helps. Join our Facebook group, Bloody Murder Podcast. And follow us on Twitter. Thanks for listening. And we'll be back next week. Goodbye and adios. And keep kicking against the pricks. Kick them hard. Kick them hard. <laughs> Kick him hard, you rat ass, 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 berry, ass beret, berry beret. The kind you find in a really fresh store. <laughs> <laughs> if it was warm, he wouldn't wear much uh, more. You're such a Yeah, you're a cunt. You're my favourite cunt. on my head since 1997.